Okay, perhaps we can make a start. Um, good morning, afternoon or evening, and welcome to this UNIDIR event on the implementation of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, otherwise known as the TPNW. Uh, this treaty will enter into force this Friday on the 22nd of January. And ahead of entering into force, UNIDIR has set up a series of events to look at the implementation of the TPNW. It seems treaty implementation is often a less high profile process than treaty negotiation. And historical experience with other arms control and disarmament agreement treat uh, and treaties suggests that states parties have on occasion underestimated the requirements for effective implementation. So to explore what is required to implement the TPNW, to look at who is involved and how to do this, this series of short events um, will consider different issues related to implementation and we'll do so with a practical focus. In the coming weeks, we will look at implementation in terms of institutional support, compliance and verification, and the consolidation of the TPNW. However, at this first event, I wanted to focus the discussion around national implementation, victim assistance and environmental remediation. And to do this, we have three excellent speakers. First, I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador, excuse me, Alexander Kmen, who is Director of the Disarmament, Arms Control and Non-Proliferation Department in the Austrian Federal Ministry of European and International Affairs. Prior to returning to this position, which he held between 2011 and 2016, Ambassador Kmen was on sabbatical as a senior visiting research fellow at King's College London. And prior to this, served as the Austrian permanent representative to the Political and Security Committee of the European Union. He has been closely involved in the humanitarian initiative that led to the TPNW and has evolved and devised the humanitarian pledge that emerged from the Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons in 2014. Second, I'm delighted to be joined also by Dr. Bonnie Doherty, Associate Director of the Armed Conflict and Civilian Protection and a lecturer on law and the international and the international human rights uh, at Harvard Law School. Dr. He played an important role in the negotiation of the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and I'm very grateful she has taken the time to join us at this event. And last, but by no means least, is my colleague Hanata, uh, Hanata Hesman Delacar. Renata is a political scientist and researcher at UNIDIR, where she leads the Gender and Disarmament Program. Prior to joining UNIDIR, Renata was a consultant on the National Implementation Measures Project at Vertic, providing legal assistance on issues related to UNSCR 1540 implementation. And she has written on issues related to the TPNW, including a forthcoming journal article on national implementation of this treaty. So I'd like to thank all three of the speakers for joining us today. The format for today will be a moderated conversation, and I will begin with a series of questions to our panelists who will then provide short responses. After a couple of rounds of questions from me, I will open up the virtual floor to question and answers and invite participants to post questions to our panel. I should point out all panelists are speaking their personal capacity at this event. <clears throat> And also, as we are quite constrained for time, rather than take oral questions, I would encourage participants to use the Q&A function to submit written questions. This should be at the bottom of your screen in the bar at the bottom of Zoom. Um, particip other participants will not be able to see your questions, and we will try and get to as many questions as possible, but we can make no promises because of the limited time we have available. I should also add, please don't feel you have to wait for the question and answer submit, uh, session. Please feel free to submit questions at any point. Uh, before proceeding to the Q&A session, though, I'd like to offer the floor to Ambassador Kment to provide some scene setting with some background introductory remarks on the TPNW. So with that, if I may hand over the floor to you, um, Alexander, the floor's yours. Uh, thanks a lot, James. Thanks a lot for the kind uh, introduction and the invitation to participate in this UNITY event, which of course is uh, very timely because of the TPNW enter into force uh, this week, which will mean that for the first time, uh, 70 years after uh, the first uh, uh, deployment of these weapons, and also more than 70 years after the first UN General Assembly resolution uh, called for a prohibition and uh, abolition of nuclear weapons, these uh, weapons will be subject to an unequivocal prohibition under international law. 
it's based in a way on the rationale that uh, UN Secretary General, former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon laid out in 2013 when he said there are no right hands that can handle these wrong weapons. Uh, the TPNW is a new and young treaty, uh, sort of the new kid on the block, if you want to use this expression. And many issues are, are new and need to be discussed still and determined. Uh, and of course, thorough implementation, as you said, is essential for any treaty's impact, uh, uh, its strength, and ultimately its contribution to international peace and security, which makes this UNIDIA uh, workshop series uh, particularly timely to start drilling a bit more into these issues on the implementation of the TPNW in all its aspects, um, which comprises, which I think you laid out very well in the way the meetings are structured, how states are to implement uh, the provisions, uh, both the positive uh, obligations and the prohibitions of the treaty, then uh, how to support the treaty and states parties institutionally, um, how to deal with verification and compliance, and then how to consolidate the treaty and how to consolidate the norm with which I understand, uh, uh, which I understand to mean uh, um, to a large extent how to implement Article 12 of the TPNW, which deals with universalization, as well as what states parties should be doing in concrete terms to prepare for the first meeting of states parties. The TPNW um, entering into force is a milestone in nuclear weapons diplomacy and in international law. It's a also a very important counterpoint to otherwise uh, uh, more dire developments in the fields of nuclear weapons that we've seen and we are seeing um, massively increased investments in nuclear arsenals in delivery systems development of new types uh, uh, sizes of nuclear weapons uh, and we are effectively already in a nuclear arms race one that is gathering pace um, we see the rejection of existing treaties, uh, previous commitments. Um, we have a few days left uh, to see what happens to the new START treaty. We, of course, all very much hope that it will be and its important security achievements will be uh, safeguarded. There is an expansion of potential nuclear weapons use scenarios, uh, including threatening use of nuclear weapons in response to cyber attacks, for example. We've seen some uh, rather loose talk about nuclear weapons use. Uh, and then of course, against the background of uh, nuclear arsenals being modernized uh, and expanded, there is increased pressure on preventing the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons. These are of course all worrying developments. Uh, we see a, a further erosion of trust among states and uh, stronger political, geopolitical tensions Nuclear risks are on the rise, be these the risks that result from the practice of nuclear deterrence or the risk of accidents, human or technical errors, or from the new risk drivers introduced by new technologies. It's for good reasons that the doomsday clock that I think most of our participants will, will know today stands at 100 seconds before midnight, which is closer than it's ever been and we need to break three from this uh, vicious circle. Uh, also, we've seen, as I mentioned briefly, the undermining and dismantling of multilateralism, and in particular in the field of uh, disarmament, arms control and non-proliferation are worrying developments. And against this background, the, the TPNW represents a very important signal. It's a clear stand by large sways of the international community that we cannot go on as before, that we cannot continue with a high risk approach to uh, international security architecture that's based on nuclear deterrence and nuclear weapons, uh, that we need to move away as an international community from um, what uh, many consider an illusion of security. The prohibition, of course, is only the beginning. It's uh, setting the legal basis for more nuclear disarmament steps. So in addition to the unequivocal prohibition based on the rationale that the TPNW uh, puts, puts, uh, puts forward, uh, the prohibition is also, in my view, a conceptual necessity uh, for the international community to actually be able to move away from nuclear weapons for good. 
Um, the TPNW raises some very profound questions about uh, security, whose security we're talking about, about legitimacy and about responsibility and responsible practices in international relations. And this is, this is a discussion that needs to be had uh, in the international community with states that have these weapons, with states that uh, believe in the security uh, benefit of these weapons. Unfortunately, too little of this discussion has taken place. Um, and of course, the arguments are the humanitarian consequences and risks of nuclear weapons, which are too high. Um, risks and consequences one can measure and that needs to be weighed against the alleged security benefit of nuclear weapons, uh, which uh, is very difficult to prove and disprove, but it's a discussion that urgently needs to be had. Um, the TPNW strengthens the, the arguments for moving away from nuclear weapons, and it provides a clear and unequivocal legal basis to do this. Clearly, not everybody is convinced, uh, and in the final analysis, we will only achieve this goal if we move together as an international community. And even though nuclear weapons remain a fiercely contested topic, the discussion about the profound arguments uh, on which the TPNW is based uh, can and must be had, whether one agrees with the TPNW or not. Um, and I'm sure states parties of the TPNW want to have this discussion. It's now important to to shape the treaty, its mechanism, and to be serious about the implementation. And uh, this coming year will be very important in that sense. The treaty stipulates the first meeting of states parties to be held within one year of entry into force. Um, Austria has offered to host this meeting on this, at the seat of the United Nations in Vienna, and we're very much looking forward to this meeting. Uh, the, the, the work UNIDIA uh, is doing and the discussion that is initiated with this series of workshops will be extremely useful for states parties uh, of the TPNW in their preparation of the first meeting of states parties in thinking through all the aspects that need to be uh, addressed at this first meeting of states parties and uh, um, I wanted to thank uh, UNIDIA for this uh, very good initiative and uh, with that I think I, I, I pass the floor over to you thank you very much for this uh, for inviting me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexander. And indeed, uh, thank, thank you for your opening remarks. I think that's, that's really useful. And I think you also correctly uh, paint a rather stark picture of the wider international security environment, as well as providing some really useful context to the TPNW and indeed this event series. So thank you kindly for that. Um, what I will do now is proceed to the moderated discussion and for the first sort of part of this event, what I wanted to do was to operate around three themes, beginning with a rather basic question of what do states actually need to do to implement the PPNW, um, so what is required in terms of national implementation. So um, perhaps if I can come to you first, Hanata, uh, with the question of what, what do states need to do to implement the TPNW in terms of legislative and regulatory activities? Um, over to you, Hanata. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, yes, thank you very much for this kind of invitation to be a part of the panel. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have an article coming up, which is called the TPNW in Practice, where we look at uh, requirements for national implementation. So I'll be giving today a little bit of a sample of the article that we hope to be published uh, very soon in the coming uh, weeks, I hope. So in terms of uh, legislative requirements, after ratifying the TPNW, states have an obligation to criminalize several activities. These activities are laid out in the articles of the treaty and including the main prohibitions, which are it's part of Article 1, the development, testing, production, manufacture, use, transfer of nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. Um, this process may involve the amendment of existing laws and regulations or the introduction of new law. It may be the case that countries joining the TPNW already have legislation in place that cover most of these uh, aspects because of either international agreements, regional treaties, or national commitments. Let's say if a country is part of a nuclear weapon-free zone, it may be that some of these activities are already typified as crimes. 
or if uh, countries have enacted legislation to implement Security Council Resolution 1540, there may be some um, significant overlap there. But an important uh, difference to note is that Resolution 1540 uh, requires states to take measures uh, concerning uh, non-state actors. So that will be a difference between 1540 and the TPNW is that the TPNW um, applies not just to non-state actors, the criminalizations apply to all um, natural or legal persons uh, within the territory of the state, which would include also government employees. Uh, in view of this, it's unlikely that the current TPNW membership, which is made up by non-nuclear armed countries, will have to start from scratch in terms of legislation. Um, the process will be more complex if or when the membership expands to countries with different nuclear status, uh, nuclear armed countries or countries uh, who are under the, the so-called uh, nuclear umbrella. Uh, it's also important to note that the TPNW, in addition to the prohibitions, it contains the so-called positive obligations, uh, which are provisions related to people who have been affected by nuclear weapons use or testing and to the environment as well. So there may be a need for additional legislation guaranteeing the rights of survivors to assistance in specific countries. But in all cases, I think the first step uh, would be an assessment of existing legal and regulatory framework to ensure consistency between the international agreement and the national legislation. And in conducting the assessment, uh, the following issues should be considered, I think, uh, the main question is, does the law and the regulatory framework in place comply fully with the provisions of the TPNW? Uh, do key terms used in legislation, do they have clear and consistent definitions? Are institutional responsibilities for implementing the laws and regulations, are they clear, are they consistent? Uh, do they avoid delays, confusion, bureaucratic conflicts, or potential abuse for authority? Uh, needless to say, the process of national implementation and, and, and national legislation review should be done by state parties in accordance with their own internal legal processes and respective legal culture. For instance, if they have a common law tradition or a civil law system, that will differ how they go about uh, reviewing and enacting new legislation. And in addition to the legislative review, I mean, it's important to ensure that there are means and there is capacity to enforce uh, the law. So uh, to investigate, to prosecute, to punish any of the related offenses. Um, perhaps that may lead to specific trainings for law enforcement personnel or other related measures. Um, it may be that certain uh, skills or equipment may be required to ensure that uh, law enforcement can effectively go about implementing uh, the necessary legislation. Um, I think these are the, the first steps in terms of, of um, national legislation to implement the TPNW. So I'll, I'll stop uh, here. Thank you, Hannah, for, for thought in that. Uh, but as you say, it's not starting from scratch, uh, which, is, which is good to know. Uh, if I can move on to the next question, uh, unless any of the other panelists want to respond to that point, I'd like to move to the question on effective implementation of um, provisions related to victim assistance and environmental remediation. Um, Bonnie, if I could put this question to you, and please do feel free to follow up on any points from Hanata's answer, should you wish. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks to Unidir for inviting me to join this uh, panel. It's great to see everyone and to know that we have such a uh, wide audience today. So thank you for that. Um, just to build on what Renata said, I think, uh, and to transition into the positive obligations on victim assistance, and environmental remediation, one thing that's really important about the implementation uh, provision is, as it, she said, it requires both penal sanctions for the prohibitions, but also um, implementation measures for the positive obligations. And that ensures there's a comprehensive response to the harm caused by nuclear weapons, both preventively in terms of you know, eliminating future harm, but also dealing with the harm from past use and testing. So there's several steps countries can take or uh, should take to implement the, the victim assistance and environmental remediation provisions. And they can draw heavily on uh, past treaties where those provisions, uh, similar provisions appear, such as the Convention on Cluster Munitions and the Mine Ban Treaty in particular. And the obligations, um, while many of them are on affected states parties, there's also obligations on donor states because of the associated provision on international cooperation and assistance. Uh, 
So the some of the, the first sort of bucket of implementation measures, I sort of I consider the more practical steps. Uh, the first I think is really critical is to um, assess the problem, uh, which allows you to uh, you know understand what the situation is, prioritize needs, and figure out a solution. And, and although we all know that nuclear weapons cause you know catastrophic humanitarian consequences, more detail there is needed to really hone in on on what the problems are and how to deal with them. Uh, there also should be you know affected states should establish a national plan, set a budget, uh, establish a focal point. Uh, things like that that helps establish a framework, a mechanism for implementing victim assistance and environmental remediation. And similarly, donor states should set up a mechanism for providing assistance. Uh, the second point would be that these two provisions should be uh, interpreted broadly. Victim assistance should encompass, according to the treaty, is required to encompass uh, medical care uh, for physical harm, psychological support, uh, measures to promote socio and economic inclusion uh, on the environmental remediation front. States should both cle uh, clean up the, the, the contaminated areas, whether it's through containing nuclear waste or removing nuclear waste, as well as reduce exposure to prevent future harm, such as through uh, marking and fencing or risk education, measures like that. And finally, I think implementation should be guided by um, Four, four major principles. The first, non-discrimination. Uh, it's mentioned in the treaty and it's obviously a fundamental principle of international human rights law that you should not be discriminating uh, against or among affected individuals. Uh, victim assistance should be accessible. It doesn't do any good if people can't, can get, can't get, get it to it. Uh, transparency is also really important. Uh, it both uh, informs the type of assistance that other donor states provide and uh, it also ensures that there is monitoring and accountability uh, to ensure that victim assistance and environmental mediation, as well as international assistance are all provided. And finally, I, the, the last principle I wanna highlight here is inclusivity. Uh, it's critical that survivors uh, and affected communities are incorporated into every stage of the, of the design, implementation, and uh, evaluation process. So those are some of the steps. Obviously, they can all be fleshed out over time, but I think those are key key points to consider as, as states start to move from obligations on paper to implementation and practice. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. There's some useful practical steps and indeed some principles to orientate the process as well. So thank you for that. And one of the things that strikes me from listening to, to both um, Bonnie and Hanata is, is really the extent of requirement to do this. It's, it's quite a big task for some states, even though it's not starting from scratch. And um, this kind of leads to my next question, which I'll, I'll direct to Alexander, first of all, if I may. But it's a really a broader question of some of the challenges that are likely to be faced by states seeking to implement the provisions of the TPNW. Um, I'll put the floor to you first, Alexander, please go ahead. Thanks. Of course, it's it's uh, it's difficult to generalize. Uh, um, I would say that maybe for the vast majority of uh, of uh, current states parties and uh, maybe the states parties, uh, um, uh, the, the the sort of next uh, uh, next states parties that will come on board, I don't think there's going to be a, a huge amount of of uh, of difficulties to implement. Uh, uh, yes, there are things to do. Uh, 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 you can build on you, you can build on uh, past experiences uh, and 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 uh, work done in past treaties, but uh, but the implementation burden on the whole is uh, compared to most uh, treaties is is uh, is uh, uh, is not particularly challenging. What is a challenge is that of course we are in general in a very contested space. Uh, that it's it's a it's a it's a politically uh, um, uh, contested uh, uh, topic. Um, it will also vary from state to state. Uh, um, for example, one of the topics that, of course, was discussed uh, at length uh, during the negotiations was the issue of military cooperation uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, within uh, military uh, alliances or with states that uh, possess nuclear weapons. Uh, this is something that will certainly be discussed uh, further in the implementation phase at the first meeting of states parties at subsequent meeting of states parties. Uh, other issues like like that, uh, things that were uh, discussed uh, um, uh, 
uh, at length during the ne negotiations will certainly be uh, uh, will will continue to be discussed uh, um, uh, in the implementation uh, phase. Um, then we have, of course, a, maybe a small number only, but uh, um, uh, some states parties uh, um, uh, that will come on board may not yet have a comprehensive safeguard agreement uh, and will then have to get one. I think that's a, that's an important aspect. And of course, uh, um, introducing uh, criminal uh, provisions as was already mentioned. Um, and one aspect that I think is important uh, is Article 12 of the TPNW. It's the treaty that deals with universalization. Uh, it is an obligation of states parties uh, to do that, to promote the treaty, to promote the rationale of the treaty. Um, and there I come again to the uh, issue I mentioned at the start that, of course, this is a contested political uh, topic and how to implement uh, uh, this provision uh, in this political environment will, will be uh, a challenge, uh, not an not a unsurmountable one, but uh, will certainly require lots of discussions and fine tuning uh, um, among states parties. I'm sure there are other aspects, but these are just sort of first comments that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, before moving to the second cluster of questions, if I could invite and indeed perhaps encourage participants, if there are any questions you'd like to put to the panelists, please do feel free to do so. There should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So please do feel free to submit questions as we move forward. Um, but actually, if I could follow up and move into my next set of questions, it actually, Alexander, your last answer links quite neatly to, to the second cluster of questions on how is this done? And one of the important questions here is, who, who does what in these situations? And I realize there's no one size fits all, as, as you mentioned. Um, but it'd be interesting to get a sense of who you think needs to lead this forward in as far as possible, as far as you can generalize. Um, and if, uh, perhaps I can begin with you, Alexander, then open this up to other, other panelists as well. I think it's important to distinguish between uh, the work of implementation at the national level and at the international level. And, and uh, uh, nationally, I think the situation will just simply be different in every country. I could uh, tell you a little bit uh, how, uh, how it was done in Austria, but um, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it depends on the structure, it depends on the, on the, on the competences. Uh, uh, at, the, at the treaty level, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, uh, you, you, uh, you have the implementation mechanisms, you have the meeting of states parties, you will probably have at the end of the first meeting of states parties some decision in more concrete terms how to continue to implement some, uh, it could be working groups, it could be uh, standing committees, or uh, if you look at past experiences, how to, how to take specific issues forward. And this is where states will then uh, cooperate, some states will take uh, uh, specific responsibilities. Then, of course, one aspect uh, that has been uh, a feature of the, of the process leading to the TPNW is uh, strong involvement of uh, civil society. Well, of course, the implementation as such is a, matter for, is a matter for the state's parties. I'm sure that there will be uh, uh, vibrant exchanges uh, and vibrant cooperation and uh, collaboration with uh, with uh, voices from civil society with experts uh, so it there is no there is no one size fit all um, uh, it will depend very much uh, uh, on the individual states but i think at the at the at the state party level at the sort of international tpmw level uh, I hope, I think it would be, would be uh, good to see uh, innovative, uh, flexible and uh, uh, dynamic uh, um, way of cooperating and implementing uh, the, the treaty. That's probably not specific enough to compare to what you wanted to hear, but I find it difficult to, to uh, generalize because it simply will, uh, the perspectives will, will depend on the setup of States parties. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. I think that's, that's useful. And now, Hanati, you wanted to follow up on one of those points, but with your indulgence, if I may, I'd like to combine a question to yourself and then to Bonnie as well. So, uh, Hanati, if I might ask you, um, the TPNW refers to um, providing age and gender sensitive assistance, and I wonder how, how you think that, that is going to be implemented, because that seems quite a, a, a difficult um, operational clause to address. And then perhaps, Bonnie, if I may, and this follows on from a point um, made by Alexander on, on in innovative and flexible approaches, but perhaps the idea of innovative approaches in particular. What role can the private sector and civil society play in the implementation of the TBNW? So perhaps if we can begin with you, Hanata, then I'll hand over the floor to you, Bonnie. Yes, uh, thank you, Jamie. So um, I, I wanted, I think it's important uh, in this event and in this conversation also to perhaps anticipate things that may become a problem later on and maybe a challenge so that we can already start working on this. And uh, in terms of challenges at the national level, uh, when I spoke before, I talked about the legislative review. It can be a burden uh, sometimes to do that. And it may be that it's not an immediate priority for countries. I mean, we're going through a pandemic right now, you know, <laughs> Uh, lots of resources have been diverted to, to fight that, rightly so. So just to say that uh, perhaps uh, it may take a little bit time for countries to align its legislation to the international agreement. And as the ambassador was saying about um, cooperation with civil society, in this regard, uh, Vertic has been doing, uh, working on national implementation measures and providing legal assistance for many, many years. So that is just to say that there are resources in the civil society that can help to tackle the main challenges. And another challenge that may come at the national level uh, relates to the provision of assistance is who actually is entitled to the assistance. Uh, this can be a contentious issue and, and, these, and, and the TPNW does not provide a, a definition uh, for that. So uh, we have seen um, that this, this has uh, different parameters have been used to establish who is a victim or not, and who uh, a survivor of um, exposure to nuclear radiation. Um, the ionizing radiation, I mean, the, the problems, the health problems, they may take um, many, many years to show up and there may be difficulties in establishing direct casualty between the radiation exposure and health impacts. So this, this can, can also be a challenge that we'll need to, to take into account um, at the national level. And, but again, as the ambassador was saying, the TPNW can serve as a forum for exchange also of best practices, of uh, experiences. And in, in, in the specific case of victim assistance, um, it may be that it will be an, an opportunity to break the silos between inside the arms control community because we have the uh, conventional weapons side of things and we have the WMD side of things and not always um, there is a dialogue be between these two sets of, of arms control. Um, so uh, we know that cluster munition and, and landmine land convention, uh, both conventions have been implementing um, gender sensitive and victim assistance. So it's, it's a time also to learn from that community. Uh, which I find it uh, very interesting. Uh, on the issue of gender, uh, Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the TPNW establishes an obligation to adequately provide age and gender sensitive assistance to individuals under uh, a national jurisdiction who are affected by the use or testing of nuclear weapons. Um, and why do we have that clause? Um, I think it's, it's because there is a lot of research showing that different groups of society are affected differently by um, the specific uh, ionizing radiation and, uh, resulting from nuclear weapons use, nuclear weapons test. Um, so there's, there's research showing that uh, with uh, survivors from uh, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, showing that the risk of developing and dying from solid cancer due to ionizing radiation exposure uh, was nearly twice as high for women as for men. There is a similar research on um, following local fallout from um, nuclear testing in Kazakhstan, also indicating a higher rate of certain kinds of cancers for women. Um, there are studies also following Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster, uh, showing that uh, higher levels of 
steroid cancer in children and adolescents, in which the diagnosis was significantly higher in females. Uh, Pregnancy-related complications are also another set of sex-specific effects, and there are also indications of impact of ionizing radiation on men's reproductive health as well, for example, loss of fertility. And this I'm quoting from our study at UNIDIR, uh, it's called The Missing Link, uh, where we have an overview of the literature, the scientific literature on sex and gender-specific uh, effects. So if you are curious about the sources that I'm using, they are all there. Um, and in addition to uh, biological differences, researchers have explored how socially constructed characteristics and relationships um, lead to different experiences of nuclear bombing or nuclear accidents. For instance, uh, there are indications that mothers with children had a higher prevalence of mental health problems after nuclear accidents of Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. Uh, images, beliefs related to women's bodies and marriage and reproduction also seem to contribute to intensified discrimination experienced by women exposed to radiation. Um, so uh, many of women who have been exposed to radiation, they fear the prospect of marriage, of having children, they worry that radiation will continue to compromise successive generations. And there's also a significant impact on, on, on men and how they are perceived and, and their role in society. Uh, for instance, one study showed that um, Marshallese men were hurt by the restrictions placed on fishing and gathering food in the aftermath of nuclear tests, and that undermined their traditional role, um, impacted their economic status, as well as their perception of self-worth. So just to say that uh, we should be aware of the differential impacts of nuclear weapons use and testing on different groups of societies. And uh, this can inform actions to support uh, survivors. How do we implement this? As I said, we can learn from the experience of the Landmine Ban Convention and the Close Ammunition Convention. And, but the idea, what, what I would like to point out is that it's important to build gender expertise within the regime, within the TPNW regime. So I would encourage uh, national actors and also uh, eventually the International Secretariat uh, to develop skills in gender analysis and offer trainings in this regard as well. I think that would be very useful for state parties and uh, to implement this clause. And it's also important to develop mechanisms to collect data related to the needs of survivors and to ensure that the data is disaggregated by gender, age, and if that's the case, disability as well. And this should help us overcome simplistic understandings of who the victims are and what their needs are. So we should take this information into account when designing, implementing, and reviewing victim assistance programs and hopefully that will make for a more uh, effective um, implementation. Thank you. Okay, uh, if I can hand the floor over to uh, Bonnie, but just prior to doing so, um, there's a couple of questions are starting to emerge in the Q&A uh, function now. Um, one of these actually follows up on a point you touched upon there, Anata. So this relates to um, figures existing about possible numbers of victims um, uh, and is there data on that and also related to environmental aspects as well so do we have data so I'll come back to you on that and then um, Alexander if, if I may there's also a question starting to urge which maybe you could take on um, on what international institutions could be called upon to determine the parameters for victim or environmental assistance need what, what role could there be for the IAEA there another panelist as Mel may wish to take that question I should also point out we do have a session on institutions next week, but I think there's still space for, for addressing that. But first, if I could come to, uh, to you, Bonnie, uh, just a reminder for your question, uh, the role the private sector and civil society might play in the implementation of the TPNW. And this also links with a, a question from one of the um, participants as well. Over to you, Bonnie, you have the floor. Thanks, Jamie. So the I think the first thing I want to emphasize on this is how, and Alex said this as well, how this is very much a cooperative treaty and it, it's a shared responsibility for all of the, implementing all the articles. So just touch briefly on the state side, I mentioned this earlier about the both affected states and the donor states. And I think that um, gets to an earlier uh, point that was made about the challenges of implementing victim assistance and environmental mediation, that it doesn't the international assistance from donor states doesn't depend on nuclear armed states joining. Uh, it's, it depend, that is triggered immediately uh, that states in a position to do so have to provide assistance for victim assistance and remediation. And, and that should be understood broadly so that most states can provide something. But to complement the state role, 
uh, civil non-state actor, civil society, private sector can all play a really important role. Uh, the on the inter, inter, international organization front, the UN, the ICRC can help facilitate the delivery of assistance or the the sort of mechanisms for um, uh, making sure that environment is remediated. Civil society and other experts, um, whether it's academic or scientists or, or so forth, are uh, really important to providing expertise needed to understand the problem. Um, and that goes to helping to survey the harm that's been done, as well as to provide their expertise to how to deliver assistance. So for example, uh, you know, a specialist in the in nuclear field may have a better understanding than a state would of how to treat uh, long-term harms of radiation or how to remediate uh, the nuclear waste that, that remains from past use and testing. Civil society itself is part of that, um, bringing that expertise, but it also serves a, a role of informing states about what the situation is, but also pressuring states to act. I think they played a role of that in the negotiations, um, cooperating with, with like-minded states, and they need to keep up the pressure and remind uh, the international community, this is a, is a matter of humanitarian concern to all, to the, whole, to the whole world. And finally, it's important not to forget survivors and affected communities. I mentioned this briefly earlier in terms of talking about inclusivity, but these people know more than anybody what the effects of nuclear weapons are, what kind of victim assistance they need, what kind of environmental remediation needs to be taken. And so they should be incorporated at all stages, design stage, implementation stage, monitoring and evaluation stage. And it also serves the, the larger purpose of, of empowering them and not treating uh, the positive obligations as a, as a form of charity, but that this is, a, again, a collective effort to address the harm of past use and testing. So I'll stop there, but happy to answer any of the questions that are coming in as we go forward. Okay. Perhaps if I could just come back to you, Hanata, to follow up, and then we'll move into the last cluster of questions because I'm conscious of the time. Um, so, Hanata, to follow up on the issue of uh, the existence of data in terms of survivors, victims, but also in environmental aspects, which is one of the questions raised in the Q&A. And then I'll uh, move towards a, a selection of questions on, on looking forward and moving forward. So, Hanata, do you want to take that one first? Sure. I mean, that's a difficult one, Jamie. <laughs> uh, I don't have uh, the number, the data for, for uh, people impacted by, by nuclear weapons test or use. But when, we, when I was doing research for the article that I mentioned, um, I came across, I think, uh, uh, kind of a, more on the qualitative side of things, not much on quantitative, but accompanying you an overview of uh, what's already out there in terms of um, cleanup, environmental cleanup programs, and also um, assistance to, to people uh, who have been impacted by nuclear weapons tests or use. And there are, uh, I mean, there are, there are several interesting experiences, some bilateral collaboration, some uh, with international um, agencies, let's say with IAEA, helping to provide technology for environmental cleanup. And, uh, but, but the difference is with the TPNW now, this should become an obligation, right? So the, the status of, of the program should change as well. Uh, it's, it's not a nice to have, it's a, it's a must. So I think, and, and, and as Bonnie was saying, you don't need nuclear weapon states for that. Uh, the minute the, the treaty become, enters into force, uh, this it starts um, also to, to be enforced. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting um, aspect to highlight. Um, and, and perhaps this is a task also for the first meeting of states parties uh, to have a needs assessment. And so we can all learn and have uh, consolidated data and have uh, common standards um, that may allow us to have a, a, a better grasp of the needs of victims and the needs of, of the environment as well. Thank you, Nata. So, so if I can move on to sort of my third cluster of questions, which relate to looking forward. Um, perhaps if I could direct this towards Alexander first of all, but um, it's been raised a couple of times, the, the first meeting of space parties. So I'd be curious to get your views, um, and if you'll the rest of the panelists views on what state parties need to consider, whether they need to prepare in advance for that first meeting of states parties. And to follow up on that, there are a couple of questions and answers which kind of link in for this, which I'll get into shortly, but perhaps if I could put that first to you, um, Alexander. Yeah, 
Uh, Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, the first meeting, uh, of course, within a year after entry into force, um, and is task in many ways to set out the institutional and operational framework of the treaty. First step in preparations uh, are probably the submission of Article 2 declarations, uh, which is to um, uh, happen no later than 30 days after the treaty enters into force for a, for a state's party. So, I mean, that, that is the first uh, transparency measure that is, uh, that is uh, necessary. The meeting of states parties are governed by Article 8 of the, of the TPNW and uh, uh, sets out the objectives to, to, uh, to look at the implementation and status of the treaty, then the measures for the verified time bound and irreversible um, elimination of nuclear weapons programs. Uh, including additional programs to this treaty and then any other matter pursuant to the consistent, uh, uh, um, uh, pursuant to and consistent with the provisions of the treaty. So there are a number of specific tasks for the first meeting of states parties. Some of them, are, of course, in Article 4 related to, to the determination of timelines. Um, uh, so I think that is something that, uh, that uh, that will have to be discussed and prepared well, and uh, uh, in in uh, lots of consultations and and uh, maybe meetings like that to get a, to get a, a feeling uh, for the pros and cons with expert input uh, to allow states parties to then take the formal decisions that are that are necessary. There's probably also, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the whole area of, of positive obligations that we talked about, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, is, is, uh, is extremely important to prepare well, uh, to, uh, to um, seek as much input uh, from, from institutions, but as Bonnie said, of course, most importantly to hear from uh, people who've experienced uh, 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 this, themselves, they are the ones who uh, who need to be heard and to need to uh, need to help guide uh, states parties in a way to 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 um, take the right decisions. Uh, so there is the sort of formal aspect of what's uh, what's on the menu for the first meeting of states parties, and there I think it's extremely important that uh, states parties. Uh, uh, with all the difficulties with COVID and all the all the all the challenges that we face at the moment, uh, that there are opportunities to discuss these issues uh, well in advance uh, to be well prepared. Um, but I think there's also for the first meeting of states parties the, the the political dimension of the TPNW and the arguments on which it is based. So I would hope that the, that the first meeting of states parties is also an opportunity to uh, to highlight very much uh, the underlying rationale of the TPNW, so that it is a forum where uh, uh, also um, we get back in more detail to the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, where we discuss in detail the risks uh, uh, about nuclear weapons. So it's this uh, combination of formal aspects that are sort of on the menu of the meeting and then of course there is uh, uh, it's important to to um, demonstrate that this is a serious treaty that states parties take it seriously and and uh, and uh, come well prepared and uh, and are ready to promote uh, the cogent rationale uh, on which the treaty is based and why they ratified uh, this uh, this treaty. All of this together, of course, with uh, with uh, help and support from uh, civil society actors uh, to to um, to demonstrate uh, the um, the pertinence of the of the arguments that uh, have been built over several years. Thank you. A lot to think about moving forward. Um, I wanted to follow up on one of the questions in the, in the Q&A um, that have been submitted to Q&A on declarations specifically, and I'll um, come back to you on this, but is there a model format for the declaration? How simple should the declaration be? But before addressing that question, perhaps I think, Bonnie, you wanted to, to respond to this forward-looking question on what states need to do in preparation. So perhaps if I could offer you the floor first. Uh, Bonnie, please. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, 
I, I completely agree with everything Alex said. I, and I just wanted to unpack on the victim assistance environmental mediation side. And I guess this could be true of other, other issues as well. Um, but how important is the one MS, the first MSP is a, is a chance to sort of set the, the stage, the, the priorities for the treaty long term and the political issues that Alexander mentioned, the underlying purpose of the treaty. But I think it's very important that victim assistance and environmental mediation be part of that, that we set as that we laid the groundwork that this treaty is about the prohibitions, but also about you know addressing past harm. And on that front, I think there's the way I think of it is there are four things that the states should prepare to do. One is in their statements, there's there'll be discussion at the meeting of states parties. They should bring their national positions and talk about what they their plans for dealing with these obligations um, in terms of the declaration, which you just mentioned, Jamie. Uh, they should be prepared to recommit explicitly to upholding their obligations under victim assistance and environmental remediation, reinforcing that this is a humanitarian imperative. Uh, and the action plan, which I hope will also be adopted, as was done with the Convention on Cluster Munitions at the first meeting of, uh, at other at other um, at other treaty bodies, but it's important that the action plan lay out specific implementation steps, and some can be done within a year or two, such as a, you know, developing national plans. Some are longer term issues, such as gradually moving towards remediating the environment. But it's sort of, it, the action plan can set steps and goals for implementation. And finally, I think it's an opportunity to establish, uh, and this was mentioned earlier, working groups or inter intercessional standing committees, whatever you want to call them, that can wrestle with some of the more complicated questions about how do you draw the line between who's a victim, who's not a victim, what level of environmental remediation you need. And those intercessional meetings can be very important going forward. So I hope states will be prepared to take up all those, all those action items at the first meeting of states parties. Thanks. Thank you, Bonnie. And um, just before I proceed, if, if uh, there are any more questions, please do feel free to submit these. And we have plenty to keep us going, but more are always welcome. Um, just in terms of my list, I have a question, a, a follow-up question I wanted to direct towards Alexander on declarations. Then Hanata, I wonder whether you could take the question, which I think you've already touched upon, but this relates to what international institutions could do in terms of determining parameters for victims and environmental assistance needs, and, and what role more generally to the, for the IEA, EA and other such bodies. Um, and then there's another question which has come in, and panellists have already touched upon this point, but do panellists see particular issue areas or treaty articles in which coordination or collaboration between states parties could be of particular special value in enhancing treaty implementation? There's pl plenty there, but perhaps if I could come to you first, Alexander, if I may, on the, the um, declaration, what should this look like? How simple should it be? Thank you. Thank you. As, as far as I understand, a couple of states parties have already submitted uh, the declarations. And uh, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I mean, from what I understand, ODA is going to send out or has already sent out a template. I'm not sure, but there is a, there is a template, a, a draft uh, uh, template being, uh, being prepared to help states uh, to, um, to submit this declaration bearing in mind that for non-nuclear weapon states, uh, this will be a relatively light reporting format. Thanks. Thank you. And over to you, Hanata, and then I'll turn to you, Bonnie. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, so, if I'm not mistaken, the question was about uh, international organizations and how they can assist with uh, victim assistance and environmental remediation. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure if this would be something that could be done already in the first meeting of state parties, but perhaps so. Um, you could have a pool of organizations that have already been working with uh, environmental cleanup. And because that's a, that's a very difficult task actually. And uh, sharing what's um, the knowledge that's been developed, the research and the technology that has been developed and what could be deployed to different places. I guess that would be kind of like in parallel with the needs assessment, you could have like a capabilities assessment, what's already out there and, and what do we know about the problems. Um, I'm not sure um, how we could, define the prospects for having a unified definition of um, 
who is a, a, a victim, a survivor of uh, nuclear explosions and nuclear tests. Um, we have seen different parameters being used. Uh, let's say, uh, I think ultimately it would be uh, a decision made by the, the nation state, but uh, at times compensation for illness uh, was based on estimated doses and standard risk coefficients calculated in relation to a given, now I'm quoting, for a given individual being present in a specific area where nuclear damage had occurred. At other times, uh, the definition was tied to the development of one or other types of cancer or diseases specified in, in, the, in the technical scheme, in the compensation scheme. But this is the knowledge that we have thus far, if, if I'm not mistaken, is mostly about compensation schemes. And what we are uh, seeing with TPNW is a different approach. It may be, may be also required a, a change in mindset because uh, it's a more comprehensive assistance. It's an assistance that uh, Bonnie was saying, it's about uh, psychological support, it's about uh, economic empowerment, it's about uh, health healthcare, um, not necessarily a financial compensation. So this will be interesting also to, to monitor and to see how uh, the, the schemes we have in place, if they will be affected, if there will be change, and if, if, it's, uh, if the international community is, is able to provide support to the people that need. And in this case, I mean, uh, it was also mentioned before, there's a possibility of cooperation with donor countries. There's a possibility of cooperation with, let's say, development aid. You could channel developer, in, in theory, you could channel development funds to support um, victim assistance in this case. And even with, with the help of private sector, why not? So um, in, in the sense, there is room for innovation also, and, and we can see uh, new things that, that we hope new things and, and will come up. Okay, thank you, Henrietta. Um, so some more questions are starting to come in, and I think I've, I've raised this one before, but it's probably worth opening up to everybody. Uh, but particular issue areas of coordination and collaboration between states parties that could be of particular value um, to in, in enhancing truth implementation. And I know many of the panelists have already raised several points to this end, but if anybody wanted to come in on that point, they'd be most welcome. And I also have a question that's come in. In um, which is to all panelists, really, I think, but could the panelists elaborate on innovative ways for states parties to engage, promote dialogue, and encourage accession to the treaty? Thank you, is, is the, the full question in there. So, does anybody want to take either of those points? Um, follow up on either of those first. I'm happy to take uh, yeah. this, uh, James, if I, if I may, in terms of. Um, in terms of universalization, in a way, because that that is that is uh, that is what is meant, I guess. Uh, and Article Twelve uh, uh, was deliberately put in, so it's a treaty obligation to promote the treaty. So I think uh, uh, there again we can look at uh, past experiences uh, um, to other treaties how how universalization was was. Uh, uh, was done, was promoted. In the case of the TPNW, of course, it's a particularly challenging um, endeavor because uh, um, there is so much contestation around those issues. So I think, uh, uh, and that is also in a way answering the question, what is the area where cooperation among stakeholders would be particularly important? And I would say this is probably one aspect where this, uh, where this is very much the case. So uh, there is uh, um, the important dimension uh, of uh, uh, increasing the number of states uh, that uh, sign up to the treaty, of course. So there is the important uh, dimension of making the positive arguments uh, um, uh, in favor of the TPNW and uh, refuting some of the um, uh, criticisms that, that are being uh, uh, voiced against the treaty. And then the other aspect of sort of universalization, uh, a sort of broader interpretation of universalization is to promote the norm in countries uh, and in constituencies that are currently skeptical about the TPNW. So what, uh, uh, what we need in order, to, in order to promote the TPNW is to bring the discussion about the rationale of the TPNW into those quarters that are currently opposed to the treaty. So an important way to 
cooperate between states and uh, uh, with civil society actors is to raise uh, is to is to is the discursive aspect is to take take the arguments and we are convinced about these arguments take these arguments to those who currently are not yet convinced and I think that is that is an area which I uh, on a very personal level see as a really particularly important aspect uh, also as far as implementation of the treaty in the near term is is uh, is is concerned and the cooperation of stakeholders um uh, within the within the treaty at the state level the states parties uh, countries that have signed the treaty and are in the process of coming on board together with uh, with the civil society actors to bring the discussion forward that is that is in a sort of wider interpretation of universalization is what i would see part of uh, implementing article 12 thank you thank you and i think that's that's one of the issues we probably want to touch upon moving forward particularly the last in this series of events because i think it's an important area to discuss further um but for, uh, for now, though, if uh, Hanata or Bonnie, do either of you want to respond to, to that broader question on, on innovative, innovative ways to engage, promote dialogue, um, or areas of coordination, collaboration? Sure, uh, I'll just Hanata, say, sorry. yes, I'll just say something very, uh, running the risk of stating the obvious. Uh, I think with this treaty, there is a potential for uh, creating a community of practice. What we've seen in the realm of, let's say, uh, the landmine ban convention or the cluster munition convention is that uh, you establish uh, regular meetings and um, among implementing partners. So not only states, but, go, but NGOs, academics and activists as well to share lessons learned at local, national, regional, international levels. Um, I think this, this treaty, because of its particular history in which civil society was very active, it has a great potential for, for this type of uh, civil society network and, as Bonnie said, inclusivity involving survivors and affected communities in all stages. So um, maybe this is something that we should keep in mind and, and, and this could be, uh, let's say, spontaneous networks, but it could also be something that the Secretariat uh, takes upon itself to, to actually promote and encourage throughout the, the implementation process. Yeah, it seems like a particularly useful idea, of, um, particularly moving forward in terms of implementation and enforcement as well of these sort of treaties that can often help with sharing the lessons learned. Um, I'm conscious of the time, but, but Bonnie, did you want to take that question at all? And then I'll ask all, all panelists whether there's any sort of final thoughts they want to add before I um, wrap up. But uh, Bonnie, first of all, on the, those two questions. I don't have too much to add because I think my fellow panelists have answered them very well. I, mean, I think Article 12 is, is crucial and there, I thought I liked what um, Alex said about promoting the norms and that can be done through the declarations. So there was a question about declarations earlier, but also on a national uh, state to state basis, the community of practice, I agree with Renata is very helpful. And I, I would also, I guess just, to, there was an earlier question about which areas collaboration is particularly important on. And, Again, we've talked about this, but just to remind people about the environment remediation and victim assistance, I mean, Article 7 makes it an obligation to provide assistance. And that assistance can come in such a wide variety, just like, you know, it's important to remember that it can be financial assistance, but it could also be technical advice or, you know, equipment or, you know, human resources, things like that. So, um, and then, and, and, and that, and I guess my final point on that with that, because again, I don't want to, I'm mindful of our time, but it's just that the uh, Article 7, which requires international assistance, also requires all states to cooperate in implementation of the treaty beyond with regard to Article 6. And I think that goes to, they should cooperate re with regard to universalization. They could also share you know, best practices in terms of national implementation measures or how to you know, establish safeguards, things like that. So it's a broad-based um, issue, but I agree that universalization and Victim assistance, environmental mediation are key points, in particular for cooperation. Thank you. Uh, before wrapping up, I wanted to offer all the panelists a um, chance to make any sort of closing final points, or indeed perhaps there are one or two concrete practical steps which maybe you think worth uh, are so important it's worth raising these again for our, our participants um, to be reminded of. 
Um, so I'm not sure how best to order, but perhaps if we could start with you, Alexander, and then Bonnie and then Renata. Um, please, you, you have the floor. Thanks, I'm, I'm not prepared to offer a, a amazing final wisdom. Just maybe, maybe, a, maybe a comment that uh, uh, you alluded to it in your introduction that there is always sort of more buzz in the negotiation, uh, in the build-up to negotiations, and of course there was a lot of buzz in the negotiations of the TBNW, uh, but uh, the implementation uh, is is uh, maybe sort of uh, less exciting on the face of it, but of course uh, hugely important, and uh, and. Uh, I think it's, I mentioned that before, I think it's extremely important that uh, all the stakeholders uh, keep uh, keep the political focus uh, uh, on the TPNW uh, and, uh, and keep, uh, uh, keep the focus on uh, making it a serious and well implemented uh, treaty. Uh, and I think this is, this is one of the, one of the, uh, most important con contributions that can be made in order to uh, to project the normative strength of the TPNW, which is of course ultimately what we all want uh, to project uh, uh, this normative strength of the treaty into the nuclear uh, weapons discourse even a lot further than what we've done uh, until now. So uh, this is just a plea for the sort of Taking the implementation uh, also seriously, and 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 uh, and uh, um, specifically also keeping uh, the partnerships uh, uh, strong that have uh, gotten us uh, as far as we got. I think it will be important to to continue in this uh, uh, very cooperative uh, um, uh, spirit uh, that that uh, that has uh, led us to the TPNW until now, uh, and. With that, of course, we have uh, um, the best opportunities to convince uh, those that are currently that remain skeptical for the time being. Thank you. Thank you. That's really useful wrapping up. Um, okay, now Bonnie or Hanata, do you wish to? Bonnie, please. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think you're right that implementation sometimes gets, uh, it seems less sexy than negotiation. And I think it's really important at the first that the first meeting of states parties is a key step in this in this process and that it doesn't just become business as usual but that the first meeting of states parties and the following meeting of state meets of states parties continue to advance the treaty um, i know the vntn declaration from the first meeting of states parties the convention on cluster munitions their slogan was vision into action and i think that's sort of a good model of how do you turn the words on paper into words in practice uh, and, the victim, and the meeting of states parties both is a serves a symbolic purpose in setting a precedent for our priorities. Uh, it sets uh, guidelines which can help direct where we go with implementation. So I encourage states as well as civil society and others to keep up the energy um, that they had to lead to the negotiations, can continue their commitment um, to a world that eliminates nuclear weapons and well as addressing the past harm and past harm from, or use from, sorry, harm from past use and testing. And uh, I think, you know, this is a key moment as was the negotiation stage. So just to remind uh, people of that. Great, thank you. And, and Hanata? Uh, I think my fellow panelists have highlighted all the key aspects. Uh, I'll just say that at UniView, we have a, a specific program dedicated to gender responsive arms control and disarmament. And we stand ready to support uh, disarmament stakeholders <clears throat> with the operationalization of gender sensitive victim assistance in the case of the TPNW as well. Thank you. Great, and thank you, Renata. Um, I'd just like to conclude um, by thanking all of our panelists. So, thank you to Renata, to Bonnie, and to Alexander. Uh, for your contributions. I think it's been a really useful and hopefully a, a fruitful discussion for um, for those that are going to be involved in the implementation of this treaty as well. So hopefully it'll be useful. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Letitia Zarkan, who is hidden behind one of the panels with the Unibria logo. And thank you for providing a, a, a sort of seamless uh, event again, Letitia, it's much appreciated. And thank you to those of you in the audience for joining this event.
Um, you will all receive an email from the Unidir team from myself and Leticia requesting feedback. This could be really useful for us moving forward. So please do uh, provide us with your frank comments and we can use that for moving forward now and sort of taking out improving our events as we advance. Um, so please do fill out that, that form. And also just uh, finally a reminder that this is the first in a series of four events that Unidir is organizing on the implementation of the TPNW. The next event will take place on Monday at 3 p.m. And this event will focus on the issue of institutional support. Um, with that, I think in keeping with my New Year's resolution to try and keep all meetings to time more or less, which I'm actually seem to be achieved um, for this one. I'll draw this meeting to a close, um, but just to say thank you again to, to our panelists, to Leticia and to all of you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next Monday. Thank you.